In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe. St. <coughs> Joseph. Pray for us. Father Pray for us. St. Ignatius, St. John Neumann, <coughs> all God's angels and saints. Pray well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So after we have made our general confession, we move into another stage in our exercise is placing another floor on the 10-story edifice, if you like that analogy. We're building a New York skyscraper, okay? <laughs> but a small one, only ten, only ten stories, okay? <coughs> the foundation is principle and foundation in which we constantly have to be recalling the, the uh, purpose of our existence. As they say in French, raison d'être, a reason for being, right? We're here to praise God, right? To reverence God. To serve God and by means of that to save our soul. Constantly we have to call to mind that very important philosophical, theological principle, the reason why we're here. Otherwise we become like the chicken with his head cut off, going around in circles. No? Yeah. We had a dog in Chile, we called him Sicopata. <laughs> Psychopata, which is Spanish for psychopath, <laughs> because he would jump and try to bite invisible birds and running after his tail. Roof, 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 roof. So we called him psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> Another dog we had in Cordoba, Argentina. You know what name we gave him? We called him Dog. <laughs> <laughs> One was psychological, another one was very prosaic, right? No. <laughs> it's interesting because there was two different philosophies of the purpose of a dog. Uh, one uh, half of the community believed that the dog's purpose was to entertain the priest. <laughs> the other half of the community believed that the dog's purpose was to ward off strangers. <laughs> <laughs> so we were divided in that yeah, issue. That's why I never really liked dogmatic theology. I preferred catechism. <laughs> I preferred catechism rather than dogmatic theology. <laughs> okay. I'm in a roll, right, Mary? <laughs> So after we make our general confession, this is the grace we're going to be begging for. And uh, by means of an, an anecdote, there was a priest that arrived at a new parish, and he preached the Sunday homily, and they were just captivated by that the new pastor. So the second week he preached the same homily, you know, don't quit a winner, the same poker, right? And then the third, same homily. He said, well, okay, you know, it's, it's a winner, you know, go for it, right? Fourth week, same homily. Did it for 10 weeks in a row. After the 10th week, the 11th week, he gave the same homily again. These two old ladies in tennis shoes come up to him and say, Father, don't you have any new homily? He said, I've got hundreds of other homilies, but I'll give it to you once you put into practice the first homily. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the grace you're going to be begging for this week. 
uh, not to be deaf to the call of the king. I repeat, not to be deaf to the call of the king. Did you hear me? Yes. Somebody was saying what? <laughs> not to be deaf to the call of the king. So you make your general confession. Now your, your ears should be more spiritually attuned to the voice of the king that's calling. The king that's calling you to carry out his mission. <clears throat> Purpose of this meditation is basically for us to become zealous apostles for Christ, to be ardent missionaries. And if we love God, we should love what God loves. And what does God love? The salvation of souls. Yeah. Yeah. You love God. If you love God, you should love what God loves, the salvation of souls. You should be willing to work, to work with him, work for him, work side by side with him. Rejoice with his victories, but also be willing to carry the cross too. You love God, you love what God loves. He loves the salvation of souls. The name of Jesus means Savior. He saved us from our sins. Okay, so the, the meditation you're going to have is the call of the king. Then you can have the joyful mysteries. We're very opportune because we're still in the Christmas season and for another eight days. So you are going to be meditating upon the joyful mysteries, which is very well synchronized, I think, with the liturgical cycle, if you ask, if you ask me. So here's the call of the king. The call of the king has two parts. It's, uh, the first is a medieval parable, and then the second would be um, uh, like a jumping board to go deep into this real desire to work with Christ to save souls. So this is the medieval parable. Okay, try to imagine a, a king who is very ambitious. And he wants to conquer the whole world. Mm -hmm. Ambitious, yeah. And he's a very intelligent king, very dynamic, very strong, very well trained, very experienced, and he wants to conquer the whole world. Being intelligent, he knows he can't do it by himself. He has to enlist help. The end of this story is that this king, he's going to win the battle. And he's going to share the victory with those who go with him into the battle. Now Ignatius asks this, asks this question, who would not be willing to follow the king? And Ignatius responds to this rhetorical question by saying, only those without reason. If I could express it as a New Yorker, only dummies, okay? Tontos. <laughs> because you know the victory is yours. But you have to go through spiritual boot, boot camp. Okay? You got to go through training. In other words, you got to really work hard at it to prepare yourself to work with the king to save, to, to conquer the world to himself. Okay, commentators on this passage will sometimes present certain dynamic figures in the history of the world that you might admire. Okay? And not that these figures have to be canonized saints, just to motivate us to get into the, uh, the whole um, dynamic of this, uh, of this contemplation. Charlemagne, if you know your, your world history well, Carlo Magno. And I'm not saying that these people are saints. Whether you, whether you like the person or not, this man named Napoleon Bonaparte was by far the most uh, talented military leader in the world back then. I mean, he wasn't a saint. But by the time he was 
younger than you, he had he was the best general in the whole world. No? Maybe some people don't really feel that appeal. Well, maybe this one. I don't know about you. I admire George Washington. I don't know about you people. And if you've done any reading on him, he was a very, there are books coming out on George Washington. Some say that the Blessed Mother appeared to him. Some say that he was converted by a Jesuit before he died. No? But you see him kneeling in Valley Forge there in the snow, you know, fighting against the Brits. No? Maybe all this is not uh, documented proof, but we wouldn't be here in this country if it weren't for George Washington. He's the a, a father founder of our country, no? And anyone who, is, who has to be legalized here, you have to know a little bit about George Washington. Okay? Don't confuse him with Abraham Lincoln. They're two different people, okay? <laughs> mm -hmm. Or uh, someone like Mahatma Gandhi, I mean... I admire the person. I mean, I don't agree with everything he said, but I admire his real desire to work for world peace, no? But maybe this, yeah. You're looking at me with a quizzical look on your face, and maybe, maybe you could take John Paul II. What do you think? You like him? So do I. How about John Bosco? How about Faustina? Do you like her? You don't like her? No? You don't, okay. Now, I, 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 doubt, I doubt anyone except me who lived there for five years know anything about the saint we celebrate today, but he was one of the greatest American saints. His name is St. John Neumann. You can just check my Facebook. I did a 13-minute talk on him. 40 minutes ago, no? Uh, just, w just one detail on, 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 the, uh, on, the, on the saint. Ignatius also says, this is a week when you want to start to read the lives of the saints. <coughs> he lived in the uh, early 1800s, and he lived in, back then it was called Bohemia, in the Czech Republic. He wanted to be a missionary to the United States to convert the Americans. And he had to leave uh, Bohemia because there were too many priests there. Wouldn't that be a good problem today? <laughs> Extraordinary, right? You know, there were so many priests in that country that they had to leave there to go to another country that didn't have enough priests. I've never heard that before, huh? Usually it's the other way around. No? So, you know, I, I, I would take someone like Bosco or John Paul II or Neumann or St. Alphonse de Liguori as someone that would be my model. Or even someone like Fulton Sheen. Have you heard of him? Okay, let's move from there. there so there's the, the parable. Let's move to the essence of this meditation contemplation. So most of us would probably be willing to follow the earthly king because we know that the, that the last word is victory and that the king would share the, the victory with you. <clears throat> How many of you would be willing to follow Christ the king? Yeah, Jehovah Witnesses here? <laughs> <laughs> be willing to follow Christ the king? Yeah. So that's the... Uh, that's the whole dynamic, because if we're willing to follow earthly king for earthly gain, shouldn't we have more enthusiasm and willing to follow Christ the king? Because the earthly king is just working for temporary worldly gain, whereas Jesus Christ has another, he has another intention. What he wants to do is Jesus wants to work to save souls. That's the purpose. He wants to save souls. Would you want to work with him to save souls? 
to work with him to save souls. I, 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 I love this dynamic because the first one we understand, we, we want to go and throw our lots in with a really good military leader that's going to win. But following Christ the King to save souls is much more important. Because temporary gain is going to be gone when we die, right? And you can't take it to the tomb. But the eternal king wants to work to save souls. St. Thomas Aquinas, you can choose him too. St. Thomas Aquinas said that one soul is worth more than the whole created universe. Your soul, the soul of your son, is worth more than the whole created universe. And that's not hyperbole either. That's the truth. If you don't believe that, let me try to convince you. St. Peter says you're redeemed and saved not by gold or silver or the blood of lambs, but you've been saved by the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So you're saved by every drop of blood that Jesus shed on Good Friday. That's how important you are. Remember the Passion of Christ of, of Mel Gibson in that movie? So Ignatius says this should be imbued with the knowledge of the saints. Let me give you a few examples. Padre Pio. Ever hear of him? Fifty years. When did it happen? 1918. Yeah. Praying in front of a crucifix in Italy. Rays of light came out of the crucifix, like St. Francis of Assisi, and his hands were pierced. And his feet were pierced. God said, you will have this for 50 years, then it'll disappear. What year did he die? 68. Humana Vita, same same year. Once uh, someone asked him, does it hurt? He said, it's not a Christmas decoration. <laughs> Why? Love of God and the salvation of souls. Amen. Love of God and the salvation of souls. Um, yesterday was a great day. We were able to do our general confessions yesterday and Friday. It was a great day. I, I was doing my daily exam and I said, wow, I don't know where. But um, I, was, uh, I was in the confessional for about 10 hours yesterday. That's a long time. So I'm kind of tired. I, I was saying to myself, hey, Floco, why are you tired this morning? Well, I had to get up for the 615 Mass too this morning. No? But it's a, good, it's a good form of tiredness because knowing that God is using me as an instrument to, to bring souls back to Christ, it's worth it. It's worth it. 
<laughs> Where's my coffee? <laughs> But uh, I, I said that not to toot my horn, but actually to, to humble myself because the curie of ours, you ever hear of him? Mm-hmm. He spent 15 hours a day for about 40 years hearing confessions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> 15 hours a day. And it wasn't, and these confessionals are they're pretty well furnished, there's good lighting and my confessional has never really worked. It's, it's always too cold or too, too hot. It's always been that way. And I, I just resigned myself to that fact. I just tell you people, put up with it for five minutes. I'll put up, for, I'll put up with it for five hours, no? Uh, but his was much worse. His was like a, free, like, like a freezer in the winter, and it was like a <laughs> sound of bath in the summer, no? And he just, uh, you know, when he got really tired, he'd get a pail of cold water, he'd, he'd douse himself. Ready for another hour. Yep, let's go. <laughs> the tricks of the trade of a confessor. Okay. <laughs> Got the tricks of the trade. <laughs> Give me a, cold, a pail of cold water. No. <laughs> Why did he do it? He loved souls. Yep. No other reason. Because on, on, a, on a human level, can you imagine listening to problems 10, 15, 20 hours a day and eating two potatoes a day, sleeping three hours on the board and then being fighting with the devil at night. We call him you potato eater. That was his nickname. <laughs> How on earth could anyone do that? Love of God. Love of God and the, the salvation of souls. Hmm? Did you ever read Fatima? How about Jacinta? How could a little nine-year-old girl suffer so much? She couldn't even read. How could she suffer so much? Salvation of souls. So if we really love God, we love what God loves, the salvation of souls. Salvation of souls. Okay, so I'd like to, t- I'd like to talk today on how, how we can be fiery apostles for Christ, how we can work to save souls. And I'd like to challenge all of you with this. Are you listening? Yes. yes. I want all of you to try, try, to bring back to the church one person every month. Don't look at me like that. (laughs) You can. I believe you can. One a month, okay? I want to try to go way beyond that, okay? I'm 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 spiritually competitive. (laughs) I think all of you have someone in mind that maybe drifted away. Okay, invite that person, maybe an examination conscience, a rosary, invite them to some retreat. Utilize intelligence, creativity, and courage. Those three virtues. Be intelligent. Be creative. Be courageous. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Those are three virtues I think you have to. You've got to be intelligent. Don't be a dummy. I think we have to do this. A fishing we will go, a fishing we will go. Hi ho the merry o, a fishing we will go. You gotta, you gotta know when to drop the nets, okay? You gotta know when to drop the nets. Years ago when we had more, more priests available, we'd have these funeral masses, and <clears throat> most of them are done in Spanish, and the church would sometimes be packed. Usually Father Larry would give me the Mass. You'd have Father John Lyons and Father Greg Staub, 
Father Al Hall in the confessional. And uh, I think, <laughs> <laughs> Five hundred souls here. No? So I start off with um, <coughs> faking a tear a little bit, you know, a little bit of fusion of sentimentality, kind of create the milieu. And I read John chapter eleven. You know, say, you know, this guy Juanito. He's a good guy. Good guy. No, no, no one's perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect either. Juanito, no? He died, you know? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe to drink a little bit too much, you know? Maybe, you know, only God's perfect, no? Where is he now? Well, we, we believe in God's mercy. That's a good pan, a good chance. He might be in purgatory. And he might not get out of purgatory until you people go to, go to confession and communion. <laughs> 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 Works. Because you see, uh, that's when people are very, very vulnerable. Go for the kill. <laughs> because people utilize emotions to push people off the cliff. Why not use it to throw them into the net? So fishing we will go, a fishing we will go. I hold them. Yeah, yeah. You gotta be, you gotta be crafty. Another example? <laughs> Loves Mickey Connors. I know them now. <laughs> I know those. Yeah, I know them. Yeah, I know them. I know the way they I know their culture, yeah. Maybe maybe better than they know it. So there was a problem. A lot of them living together in the Masiato, in Union Libre. What are we going to do to get these people married? I got it. Ah, I, I, I got it. I got it. Right here? I got it. Yeah. <laughs> Our Lady Guadalupe. They love Our Lady Guadalupe. Maybe they don't really practice it, but they love Our Lady Guadalupe. I'll have a, I'll have a group wedding. I have a group wedding. On the feast day of Our Lady Guadalupe. <laughs> ah! Uh huh. And I'll do it without any charge. Ah! <laughs> then ready? Bumpa lumpa lumpa bum, bumpa lumpa lumpa. Mariachi, yeah! <laughs> oh, mariachi, you know? And then we'll offer them the you know, Salon de Banquete, okay, the banquet hall right there. <laughs> and then we got the bishop to come. I got about 50 couples. Yeah. 50 couples. And Father Larry said, you got to do two different masses because there's no room for 50 couples, you know, with other relatives. So we did it on A Lady Guadalupe, then on Holy Family. So 50 couples who are living together from 5 to 50 years had their marriage blessed. A fishing we will go, a fishing we will go. Hi. You got to know the culture. You, know? you got to know the culture. I called my dad on the phone. He was still living. He said, is your name Reverend Broom or Reverend Moon? <laughs> <laughs> Remember the Moonies? No? <laughs> if you don't know the Moonies, he's a, he's a Korean priest, no, a Korean minister that would uh, wed huge numbers of couples. You know, they didn't even know each other, and he would, he, would, he would marry them all together. And he'd marry them <clears throat> in one of the best places outside of church. Can I tell you? Outside of church. Of course, church is a sacred ground, but this, outside of church. Yankee Stadium. Amen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they tore down the monument, but... No. <laughs> 
So uh, I try to utilize uh, all my cleverness. And Jesus said you got to be as simple as hell, but as clever as serpents or serpents. Hmm? <laughs> to try to save souls, right? So you have a daughter that's not practicing her faith. Mom, what do you want for Mother's Day? Mom, Mom, what do you want for your birthday? Chocolate? Nah, I'm already a little bit chubby. How about, uh, how about flowers? Nah, I live in Hawaiian Gardens, a lot of flowers in the yard. <laughs> now, how about take you out to a meal, to, to a restaurant? I've been cooking for you the past 50 years, no? What do you want? I want you to give up sin, go to fish, and receive communion. That's the only thing I want. Mom, I wasn't expecting that. Well, you asked me. I don't want anything else except the salvation of your soul. Now we do that. Yeah, you might bite the hook. That's called that, that's called being astute for the kingdom. Huh? <clears throat> And I <coughs> admire this, the saints and their initiative. Did you ever read the life of you ever read the life of, 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 of Fulton Sheen? He's got an interesting and he was the head of the missionary society in the United States back what forty years ago, fifty years ago. So he traveled all over the all over the world. And he tells a story. He was in London. He was in London um, outside this church. And there was this young woman that was, that, that, that was laying there on the ground, and uh, she was drunk. And she was a leading lady to, uh, to, a, play, to a, a musical. Very attractive young woman, but she, she went overboard. No? So he, he draws close to her and says, you know, um, maybe we can talk a little bit later. She said, I used to be a Catholic. He said, uh, well, why don't you come back a little bit later when you're, a little bit, you're feeling a little bit better, and we'll talk. <coughs> she said, okay, under one condition, that you do not ask me to go to confession. She didn't, she didn't want that. So Fulton Sheen said, I promise I will not ask you to go to confession. I promise I will not ask you to go to confession. So about four hours later, she wanders in the church, and it's kind of getting dark, and she's walking into the church trying to find him. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, she felt someone push her into the confessional. <laughs> pushed her into the confessional. He didn't tell her to go. He just pushed her. Okay? <laughs> She made the best confession in her life, and then late, years later, Fulton Sheen said she became a contemplative nun and has been happy there ever since for, for 50 years. Sometimes you got to push people a little bit in the right direction, right? So if you want to be uh, a, a successful, zealous apostle, you have to follow the dynamic of Fulton Sheen, <coughs> which is this. First come, then go. First come, then go. Come to me, all of you are weary, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I'm meek and humble of heart. If you'll find rest for your souls, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen? Matthew eleven twenty eight to thirty, if you want the verse, or Luke chapter five. Come and I will make you fishers of men, Luke chapter five. <coughs> so the first thing is, if we want to be successful apostles, we have to have a deep friendship with Christ. can't give what you don't have. Well, you have to have a deep friendship with Christ. Mm. 
bag that has holes in it, not going to contain too much sand, I don't think, huh? So, in as much as we have a deep relationship with Christ, we'll be able to bring people to Christ. You can't give what you don't have. So you might see it this way. The contemplative and the active life. There has to be a harmonious blend between the contemplative and the active. But the contemplative has to come first. Contemplative, you don't know what the real word means, that, that, that means our union with Christ. You gotta, you gotta be faithful to your holy hour. Not happy hour, but holy hour, okay? <laughs> okay? It could, it could be a happy holy hour, but no, your holy hour, okay? But let's, uh, let's, uh, let's up it a notch. Try to go to daily mass. Amen? Amen. Let's up it a notch. Make sure you get your rosary in, okay? Is there anything better than the rosary and the mass? Yes. Two rosaries and two masses, okay? <laughs> Right? The more the better, huh? And then you're, you know, you're applying yourself to the reading of the saints. But over the past couple of years, I've been adding to the contemplative dimension something else I hadn't done years earlier. Uh, if you come to our our, our, our monastery, our rectory. You're going up the stairs uh, toward the dormitory. Uh, Father Larry placed a portrait of John Paul II. But John Paul II studying. Yeah. You don't see too many pictures of that. Is that important? Yes. Did he study? I've heard the fact that basically he spent most of the morning praying and study. Okay. Anything wrong with that? No. no. <laughs> Here's one of the most brilliant men in the, in the Catholic Church, the name of John Bosco. You know who his spiritual director was? St. Joseph Cafasso. So he was a saint, his spiritual director. Father Benedict Rochelle said that was about the worst seminary system in the world where he went. It wasn't that good. So after he was ordained, here you got a genius, his spiritual director spent another year studying because you got to fill in some of the gaps. You know? John Bosco. <laughs> and then he's, he launched into one of the most active apostles working with, 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 with uh, abandoned boys in the history of the church, right? But you know, form yourself a little bit better. So my point is this, your contemplative life depends upon your prayer life, your sacramental life, but also you gotta study. You gotta study. Some of the people have told me uh, this is the way it used to be in Mexico is it, they'd be baptized in confirmation together. Right, Alicia? So they'd be maybe because you don't have, it's just a custom. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's the theological opinions on that. I personally don't feel it's good here because otherwise, I'll tell you the reason why is because they make their first communion confirmation, then their first communion at seven or eight, then no more study the rest of their life. Right, Mighty Cruz? That's the way it's been. And uh, 
there's something wrong with that because you're 50 years old and you have a religious education of a kid that's eight years old. Very common, no? So the law, the law of growth is such that you have to keep studying and growing, no? It's called permanent formation. The analogy I've given, I, uh, I don't want to kill a dead horse, but I think it's one of the best I have in the moment, is um, in the United States, professionals, whatever professional you might be, constantly you have to be studying and you're taking courses and seminars and that, right? You, you constantly have to be doing that. No? When I was on vacation four months ago, I spent some time with my mother and some of my siblings, and one of the siblings was uh, my, parent, my mother lives in New Hampshire and I have a brother who lives in Florida. He flew up from Florida. He wanted to spend some time with me. No? And he, we're having a dinner. I think it was the first night he said, he said he had, to, he had to pass another test. He's almost 65. Come on. 65. Uh, now, now, Yelly, you're, you're not 65 yet. You know why? I'll tell you why. Is uh, because he's, a, he's an orthopedic surgeon. Okay? Uh, He's a graduate from, from Dartmouth, summa cum laude, in Columbia. You ever hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the best in the country, no? You got the Ivy League on the East Coast, no? You'd think that a guy that's 65 years old, why on earth does he have to pass another test? I said, how did it go, Mike? He said, we got passed it, no big deal. But if he is not up to the progress you have in science, in medicine, they're going to can him. So he constantly has to be studying to be, to be proficient with the times of discoveries in medicine. Shouldn't we be professional Catholics? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yes. How many rinky-dink Catholics? <laughs> Mediocre Catholics. Catholics are basically, they don't, they don't know anything. That's the problem. Catholics that have, <coughs> this was one of my reflections on the feast day that we celebrate today, is that the kings, they made a huge effort to, to, to encounter Christ. They're traveling on a camel for 200 miles. Can you imagine doing that? You'd have blisters in your seat. Huh? You'd be walking bow-legged Billy, if your name is Billy, no? Hmm? <laughs> In other words, they made an effort to get to know Christ. Shouldn't we make an effort to get to know Christ better? Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Made a real effort. So if you really want to be a good Catholic, you've got to work at it. And it's not, it's not the law of minimum. You've got to give yourself fully. Give yourself 100%. And you'll become a top-notch Catholic. Otherwise, welcome to the club of mediocre Catholics. I belong to the rinky-dink mediocre club of the Catholics, okay? Hopefully you don't, you don't have that posted on your door outside, okay? <laughs> Misery seeks company, huh? <laughs> got to work at it. So... Uh, my point here is this, is all of you this year, you might try to f hammer out for yourself some type, of, some type of study program where you're going to really try to get to know your faith better. Now, what you're going to study, all of you, you ask your spiritual director. Okay? <coughs> all of you should have some type of spiritual direction. That's something that you should really bring to spiritual direction. Father Thomas Dubé said this, busy people only have enough time to read the best books. Mm -hmm. Busy people only have enough time to read the best books because there, there, there are millions of books out there. Sometimes people will come with me, Catholic will come in with a Protestant book. Father, should, oh, do you recommend that I read that? No. 
Why? It's a pretty good book. Well, it's pretty good, but uh, why didn't you? Don't you think it'd be ready to read to, to read maybe Thomas Aquinas? Who is he? <laughs> well, <laughs> who's he? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, <laughs> or, or the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Ever read that? Yes. You said no. I never heard about that either. Okay. <laughs> be, before reading this Protestant book <clears throat> on calming fears, no the psychological Christian approach, whatever it might be, no? Read the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Read the writings of Aquinas. Read your friend Teresa of Avila. Read Catherine of Siena. Read the writings of Pope Paul VI. He's a new saint. No? Read the, the, the documents of Vatican II, which I'm, I'm explaining in Spanish on Tuesday night, right? So much... Go out there. You want to read, read the classics. So you, 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 you know. In other words, how are you going to defend the faith if you if you don't even know what the faith is? You can't give what you don't have. So I would say, get get to know the catechism. Get to know these these documents of Vatican II. Then every one of us, every one of us is is, uh, is a microcosm. We're all different. You all might feel called to do something different to promote the kingdom. Morally speaking, morally speaking, uh, I, I think you can't go wrong if you study the whole topic of pro-life. Right? You can't go wrong. Like, uh, any of you would really want to study the whole pro-life topic, you can't go wrong in that area because that's the most important moral issue of the day is uh, the whole idea of, um, of abortion. That, that's number one. Then, and I, I don't think that the Catholics have done this enough, I think we're dragging our feet a little bit too much, is you have to study the whole topic of the LGBT uh, agenda that they're really trying to force down the throats of your little children. Okay, we have to study that more. Starting with, starting with, um, uh, I mentioned it last week or two weeks ago. Why is the practice of homosexuality wrong? Okay. Because these are the two things that are that will will destroy our society: killing unborn baby, babies, and you destroy the family. We're lost. Those are the two pillars of any society. If you kill the most vulnerable little baby in the womb, and then uh, you know you you say a family consists of just uh, two people, then there's going to be three people that love each other. The other day I was listening to relevant radio, and uh, Father Matthew was saying that there are already 70 different genders. In the UK, I think there are 100 different genders. And they mentioned certain names. I'm an English major. I never heard the words before. I've never heard them. Certain, uh, the terminology, I've never heard it. Maybe I'm naive in that area, you know. But we have, to, we have to promote the traditional marriage between a man and a woman. Because once, we, once, we, once that's rent asunder, the society is going to go down the tubes. I hope it doesn't happen. I guess you see Russia comes in and dominates us. That I think would be the biggest fear. I'm not a poli sci major, but you know, Putin is against same sex unions. Putin is allowing for the growth of the Russian Orthodox Church. Putin is building a church of Our Lady of Fatima in St. Petersburg. Did you know that? What? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the 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 the, the church in Russia is rebounding. Now, whether or not Putin is a, is a saint or not, only God knows. But he's allowing. Going against abortion, trying to promote bigger families, building churches throughout the country. St. Petersburg, which is under St. Pe uh, Peter, right? 
Berg, I think is German for city, right? The city of St. Peter, building a church in honor of Our Lady of Fatima. So uh, I, I think all of you have to, you have to step back and ask yourself, apostolically, once you have that foundation, apostolically, what is the gift that you have, have where you can save most souls? Uh, I, I, pers I personally think, <clears throat> with the support of Mary and Eric and Ed, I really, I really believe that the spiritual exercise program is important. Do you agree with that? Yes. I feel that what I'm doing now with you people is, 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 for me as a priest, I think it's about one of the most important things I do as a priest. Yes. Then after that, consecrating people to Mary. So I'm, I'm gung-ho on doing this uh, uh, as long as people, people want it. No, if people don't want it, I can't do it. No, but if people want it, I've got a wonderful team. We'll bend over backwards to promote this until the Lord calls us to the next life, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do it in Spanish and English. Usually Spanish, you've got double the number because that's the way it is here, no? <laughs> so I really believe the exercise is, is a... Because what I believe, we're forming an army of people like you that you're on fire. You can go out and you can start to really work to convert sinners those who have walked away from the church. So you form, you know, we get about 150 this session, usually Lent is usually double the number. We can form 150, about every year is about 1,000 Marys, something like that. Every year we get about 1,000 people doing the exercises and the turns, you know. It's a lot of people. Huh? And if, the, if you take it seriously, it'll spread out. Yes? <coughs> children. Um, my daughter goes to a university and um, they're being indoctrinated right now. Um, she went to a conference in the East Coast and on her ID badge that she had to wor wear for the conferences is her name, the university she attends, and then a third line, pronoun. 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 What is your Corona. Yep. And so these children that we have and pay, private schools are indoctrinating our children with this. Yes. That's why that, that's why I mentioned the the the, the pro life, basically the pro life and the pro family, those are the, the two areas where I really believe that you people have to focus at least morally. To really feel called mm -hmm. to uh, promote cap good Catholic morality, those are the two pillars. Still, the unborn baby has to be number one. You know, you got, we got to fight for that baby. And you kill a baby, that's it's uh, a baby has a right to live. We have to fight for the most vulnerable, because an older person can at least defend himself, but a baby within the womb is totally at the uh, at the whims of society. <laughs> and it's every 22nd you got an abortion in this country. 61 million since Roe vs. Wade. Roe Ro, Ro vs. Wade. 61, 62 million surgical. The chemical is going to be probably five times more. Chemical, I mean the after morning pill and, and just the chemical. Because the chemical contraception is often abort efficient. Okay? They say it's, they say it's contraception. Once, for example, once the baby is conceived, and you take the uh, after morning pill, what can happen is the zygote cannot plant itself to the uterine wall because it's slippery. What happens is that little zygote died because it can't implant itself in the uterine wall where it should be. So that's, uh, that's a micro, micro aborto, that's a, that's a microscopic abortion. People don't want to admit it, and I'm not, I'm not a doctor or a scientist, but I have little bit of common sense, that's what it is. 
I am, but I'm, I'm, I'm a moral theologian. That's part of morality. So we, we have to study a little bit of biology you know, without having a PhD from Harvard. <laughs> okay. Yes. The Walk for LA is coming up, the Walk for Life of LA. Yes. And we really need to go and show our faces there and be out there in numbers. I took the day off from work because I work every Saturday. Yes. Because I want to go there. I want to make a difference. And I'm trying to get as many people to go because yes. we need to show our faces. We need to show our numbers. Yes. We need to show that we care. Because I don't think that it's a coincidence that that's the same day that they always orchestrate also the other walk. You know which walk I'm talking about, yeah. right? Yeah. So that, that's what I'm saying. We need to go out and really show ourselves yes. on the 18th. As well as if you can go to Washington, D.C., the walk, in, the walk in, in Washington, which would probably be the 22nd, which is the anniversary. Yeah, uh, do all we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Do all we possibly can. Okay, thank you. So let's go back to the call of the king. <clears throat> okay, the call of the king. It's uh, the call, it's a call to the apostolate. Father John Harden, of happy memory, has said that the sacrament of confirmation is the call, is the call to uh, the apostolate, if you're confirmed. Father John Harden, I agree with him. Once you're confirmed, you're called, you're called to the apostolate. And when you're baptized, you're baptized as priest, prophet, and king. What is a prophet? He announces the, the good news. When you're confirmed, the bishop confirms you as a soldier for Christ and says, now you have to defend your faith and spread your faith. Okay? So you have, to, you have to defend your faith and you have to spread your faith. Defender la fe, defender la fe, in Spanish, okay? Defender or defender? Defender. Both. You, know, you want to defend your faith and you want to spread your faith. Okay, um, now, after having said, uh, giving you a, a theological or <coughs> background, let, 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 let's, try, let's try to go in an area where... It's probably the most difficult, but I think you really have to pray over this. One of the most difficult places to evangelize is sometimes in your own family. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about that, because that's where... But don't, don't give up. Uh, don't give up, but you, you all live in family, so do I, right? Well, I don't have to convert the priest I live with, no. No. <laughs> Maybe the, maybe the two cats, no, but uh, they've been on pretty good behavior lately, so I just like to teach catechism. Yep. <laughs> Do you know that uh, Fa Father Antolini, uh, he just has a real good rapport with our cats. Once, uh, once the cat got lost and he was in crisis, they said, don't worry, I got a good connection with Tony. St. Anthony. We're, we're, we're really close. St. Anthony, Father Broom, we're, we're, we're. So he said, don't worry, Father Antolin, I'll get, I'll get the cat back. So I said a fervent prayer to St. Anthony. I took a step outside the rectory, and there was the cat underneath my car. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm in my car, I know. <laughs> so, so don't underplay the value of St. Anthony. You young women, here's a good one for you. San Antonio, San Antonio, dami a novio, dami a novio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <coughs> our families. Every family is different. Some families, they're very spiritual, and the kids just collaborate very well. I mean, they'll go to church, they'll pray. That's usually not the case, though. 
Okay, the other, okay, the other extreme is this. Because you really shouldn't give up. No, don't throw the towel in, okay? No, you, that, that, you know, that's where God wants you to start first is in your family. And we as priests, we, uh, our family would be uh, the Oblate family, but also you people. So what I often do, what I do, I've been doing in the past couple of days, is when I offer the Mass, I pray for you people. And this is my prayer in reparation for all your past sins and prevention future sins that you'll become saints. So that's what I pray for. I don't pray that you have a lot of money, success, but that, that God would forgive your past sins and God will prevent future sin. You'll be able to live holy lives and that you'll persevere in grace, which is the grace of all graces. Persevere in grace. Okay, okay. So I, I think mo many of you have families where there's there's some resistance, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Let me tell you Fulton Sheen. Let me tell you a, well a story I heard. I think I heard it from Fulton Sheen. But a hundred years ago, in France, there was a doctor who was an atheist, a Parisian doctor. Paris, uh, there was an atheist, <coughs> uh, but he was baptized a Catholic, but lost his faith. But he, he married a, a French woman who was very fervent, and she tried to convert him at first, but the more she tried to convert him, the worse it got. <coughs> so, she changed strategy. And she changed strategy. No, no more, I'm, I'm not going to try to to proselytize my husband. I'm going to try to convert him by, you know, pounding him over the head with the Bible. It's just not going to work. So she decided that she basically became a victim soul. You know what that is? Yeah. When she prayed, fasted, offered up sacrifices, went to Mass, and did all in her power to open up the door for his conversion. And she had a diary. So every day she'd write down <coughs> some of her practices and some of her inspirations. <coughs> and she offered herself like a victim for the salvation of her, son, of her husband's soul. Make a long story short, uh, she contracted a, uh, a disease incurable disease. She's probably in her 30s, relatively young. She died. What happened was, uh, I mean, he, 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 he really loved his wife. They didn't agree on religion, but he, he really loved her because she was, she was lovable. <laughs> and the way that she treated him with so much respect and kindness and Compassion. I mean, he, he really loved it. When he opened up the diary, he saw all these entries in which she was offering her prayers, sacrifice, and offering her life for her husband. So, I think it was about the early 20s, Fulton Sheen now was in a retreat. And he was uh, maybe a recently ordained priest. And during the retreat, the retreat master, time and time again, during this is a, uh, the retreat master was a, a Catholic Dominican priest. He would constantly be saying during his retreat conferences, during his retreat conferences, as my beloved wife used to say, <laughs> as my beloved wife used to say, as my beloved wife used to say, in other words, this man, not only did he go to confession, but he left his practice as a, as a doctor and he became a Dominican priest. <laughs> and he preached that retreat to Fulton Sheen. 
and he told this story. The name of that woman is, uh, I think she's servant of God, maybe venerable? Servant of God, I'm servant sure. Of God, at least. Servant of God, uh, Elizabeth Lassure. Yeah. The book is something beautiful for God, I think it is. Okay. Uh, so she's a servant of God, her diary. So, I didn't want to scare you away. Um, <clears throat> but the point is that sometimes the... Uh, the best way for us to convert souls is through prayer and penance and through suffering. Colby has a three-point program of holiness. Three steps. Prayer, work, and suffering. We like the first two, but we don't like to have the third, do we? No. no. But it's the cross. The cross brings us to glory. So in your families, if you find resistance, you find resistance, pray, and offer up your communion, offer masses. Um, I lived in Texas with my daughter and her husband. Yes. And every Sunday I would go to Mass, and either one of them would take me, and the other one would pick me up with a cup of coffee and pajamas. Yes. And they never went to Mass. Yeah. And I never, I, I never preached to them. Yeah. I, I would say, Mass was wonderful today. It was about such and such. Yeah. And that was it. Yes. Uh, I never said, you should get up and get ready and go to Mass. I never said that. And today, <coughs> my daughter is the director of the Axe Retreat, and her husband is in prison, in prison ministry. Yeah. And they never miss church, and yeah. they do all kinds of fundraisers for the church. And but indire uh, indirectly, what you're doing is... Uh, you're giving them a little tidbit, a little message of what the priest said, what epiphany is, maybe. So in a certain sense, you're sowing the seed in a very subtle way, and then you're probably praying for them. Oh, yes. And now you're praying, maybe offering up sacrifices. And that's exactly what I'm saying is that when you have relatives that are they're just close to God, you, um, you, uh, you really can't force it upon them. However, there, but, but, there are, but there are cases where there are people that are kind of hungering for the truth. Um, hungering for the truth. I mean, conversions come about in millions of different ways. One of my favorite conversion stories was about 100 years ago in the same place in France. There was a couple that went, to, uh, I think, the University of Sorbonne, and they... Um, they decided that if they didn't have meaning for life within a year, they're just going to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. That was their decision. You know? uh, if you know your philosophy, you're probably studying it now. Back 100 years ago, you had what's called the French existential, existentialist school, okay? where you had uh, Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre. These are the French existentialists that lived about 100 years ago. And back then, you know, that, that leads to fatalism fatalism as well as it leads to despair if you follow that so they're about they one of the professors his name was Leon Bloy uh, heard them that they were thinking about ending their lives after a year and Leon Bloy said well look before you do anything drastic pray and both of them said well we don't even believe in God he said, well, pray anyway. <laughs> pray anyway. <coughs> so they started to pray, 
and see how God works. Both of them were uh, very keen intellectuals. They fell, they fell upon the writings of Thomas Aquinas. And they fell in love with Thomas Aquinas. Then both of them, they fell in love. And they got married. And they became, they became in the past hundred years, probably the greatest Thomists in the Catholic Church the past 100 years. And their name are Jacques Maritain and Raisa, or his wife. So that conversion came about that conversion came about by falling upon Thomas Aquinas. So God, God, God can use many, many ways to convert souls. Years ago, we had a spiritual director in Rome who was a French-Canadian who was a spiritual director and confessor to all the American-Canadian seminarians. <coughs> he was an OMI, he became an OMV. You know what that is? I didn't think so, so I'll tell you. <laughs> OMI would be Oblates of Mary Immaculate. OMI, OMV would be Oblates of the Virgin Mary. So he, he, he changed and he became one of us. Uh, and um, so all the, the Americans and Canadians had culture shock going from the United States to Italy, which is very different than America, Italy. No? Uh, he helped us to get through the tough times. One of his conferences, he told this story. He and, he and one of his uh, companions would go off and give popular missions. Because the Oblates, we give popular missions, but the Oblates of Mary Macklin, they give popular missions, like the Redemptorists. And they would do it kind of like our style. There was one priest, he was in the confessional, then another priest was preaching. But that priest, uh, he was really boring. And what he would do, he would just be, re just be reading through his notes in a monotone voice, you know, just kind of reading it through, kind of putting the people to sleep. And um, what happened, though, was someone entered the confessional, said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was 50 years ago. And here I am to make my confession. And the, the, the confessor said, well, what what motivated you to go to confession? He said, well, you know, give me this for a minute. He said that the priest was preaching, and it was kind of boring, but he said something that really, he said, wait, wait a minute now, I've got to turn a page now. So he said, well, I thought, I'll turn a page in my life. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so he used that homiletical flaw you don't say that when you're preaching. That's not part of your homily. <laughs> That's the only thing that moved him to go to the confessional. <laughs> the content, he didn't remember, but he remember, I've got to turn a page in my life. So God can use anything. <coughs> okay, well, going back to the family. Okay, if there's a little bit of openness, try to get your family members to pray a little bit. A little bit. Maybe just to bless the meal. It's just going to take 30 seconds. No? Or if they're a little bit more open, okay, let's pray. Let's pray a deck of the rose of the Blessed Mother. Nothing wrong with Marian devotion, right? Next would be this. Okay, why not, um, why not make a confession for a new year? Good idea. New Year's proposal. Next is, okay, why don't you come back to daily, come back to Sunday Mass. So little by little, maybe try <coughs> gradually to bring the person to a deeper relationship with God. So I think all of you have, all of you have different family dynamics. We all, we all come from a different family. No? 
I, I, I'm thankful that in our family, almost all of my siblings practice, but there's one that, 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 that's not practicing, which is pretty good if you have a family of nine, no? Pretty good, no? And, uh, you know, we, uh, we, 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 we've talked to him, we've encouraged him, we, but we arrive at a certain point where it's, con it's counterproductive to try to, as you were saying, to try to force him to go, it, it's not going to work, no? Because he's got an older brother that's a priest. Okay? He's got a, a younger sibling that has a degree, degree in theology from Franciscan, my, my, my baby sister, no? Um, in other words, he's surrounded by, uh, my mom, I think she's very holy, no? Surrounded by, surrounded by a lot of really fervent Catholics, but uh, not ready to make that step yet. But I believe one day, because of my prayers and masses and other, our praying, one day, one day I believe there's going to be the return. Amen? Because don't forget, the, 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 the biggest... The biggest group in this country, religious group in this country, are non-practicing Catholics. That's the biggest group in this country, are non-practicing Catholics. The biggest group in Mexico, non-practicing Catholics. The biggest group in the Philippines, non-practicing Catholics. The biggest group in Europe, non-practicing Catholics. So the biggest group... The biggest group in the world, you've got about 1.2 billion Catholics, the biggest group are Catholics that don't practice the faith. That's why I challenge all of you, try to bring back one a month, okay? So I'll be asking you, okay, to see how you're doing, okay? <laughs> what would happen if we did that? We did that every, this group and the other groups. I think within about two years, we'd have to build a mega church like Joel Olstein, no? <laughs> that church in Houston, no? We'll yeah. have to build a, a mega church, no? That, because we're not going to have enough room for, have to put the people on the rafters, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, start in your family. Then maybe look at your work environment. <coughs> maybe there's someone at work there where there's a little bit of openness. Okay, now now I, I see you're grimacing at me, okay? You've got a huge grimace in, which has elated your countenance right now, right? Is what the, what does the founder of Opus Dei say? Jose Maria Escobar Balaguer, you know what he says? He says you gotta preach by your work ethic. You got to be competent. So you're a Catholic. You you arrive late. You got a you know you, you got an hour lunch break and it's an hour and a half. You're cutting corners. You're cheating, and there you have your cross and you have your picture of a Lady Guadalupe and then you have your rosary. I mean, it's, you're a hypocrite. You say you love God, but you're not practicing it. So let your work ethic. Uh, don't, uh, be competent. Don't, don't come no, 15 minutes late. Hmm? So let your, let your work speak for itself. If you're a top neck doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or <clears throat> even flipping ham hamburgers at McDonald's, whatever it might be, do it well. Yep. Do it for the honor and glory of God. Hmm? And that will speak something maybe more eloquently than getting up on the soapbox and preaching your brood of vipers, you're all going to hell. That's probably not going to be as efficacious. Huh? I'd like to throw one last thing out at you. Um, <clears throat> I'm not called to this now, but... Um, I think there, there are so many different areas in which we can tap into um, the work for the salvation of souls. And I'll mention one. And uh, I, write, I, have, I have a blueprint in the back of my mind. But I, I'm not called to do it yet. But um, say, I was thinking, if I were the chaplain of Long Beach Memorial 
in Kaiser Permanente and Downey, where they're almost like two little cities. Ever been there? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's huge, you know? Or Har Harbor or there. Some of these hospitals, it's, it's like you're, you're in little cities. Mm -hmm. I purposely, I purposely park, a, I, I, I park across the street because I'm afraid if I park in the park, I, I won't remember where my car is. So I'll purposely <laughs> park it outside. It's so big. But I went there the other day, Long Beach Memorial, to visit one of our sick people. And, you know, I go dressed as a, as a priest, you know. It's almost impossible for me to go there without two or, two or three other people asking me to go into the room mm -hmm. to say a prayer or, or a blessing or hear a confession. It's almost impossible. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not called to that ministry uh, explicitly, but when I go, I love going because I'm, I'm, I'm not shy, you know me, I'm not, I, mean, I, I go after the people, no? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was this guy, this, this, this guy, maybe 28, they got in a car accident, he was dead, surrounded all by these Hispanics, and right away I was thinking, man. So what I did was I blessed him, and I gave them a little sermon there, and I invited them to come to church, and I had to get back for something else, but that, that it's like a, a ripe fruit on the tree because they're so vulnerable then. And I think if I were there as a permanent chaplain, with the permission of the bishop, I'd say three masses a day. I'd say mass in the morning, I'd say mass at 12, day, 12 noon, and then after evening mass, before I'd be there available for confession, I'd set up maybe a Bible group in one area, I'd set up a Marian group in another area, then I'd, I'd, I'd try to form a team of 20 missionaries to just go through that hospital and other, under ever crook and cranny, try to save every soul. I already have a blueprint. It's not my mission, but if I were, I already have it, I already have it lined up here in my mind. One of the gifts I have is that I'm very creative apostolically. I'm in, uh, in business, I'm the idea man. You give me the idea, I'll defend it, and then I'll get my subcontractor to help me to finish. Right, Eric? Right, Mary? No? I'm the idea man. Like the program that you are doing right now, I wrote it out. No? You like it? Yes. How about the meditations? Okay, yes. I, I wrote it out. No? I wrote out a first one, here's a second, and I'll probably write out a third when, I have, when I've got time. No? But there, I, I think there's so many souls to be saved harvest is rich, the laborers are few. And it, it, it seemed to be kind of a dark time. <coughs> Personally, as a priest, I think it's the best time in the world to be a priest. I think it's the best time. I think there's a lot of souls we can be saved. I believe what Charles Dickens says, the worst of times can be the best of times if we walk with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Charles Dickens. Hmm? The worst of time can be the best if we walk with the Lord. So hopefully, um, all of you, uh, I've sparked some apostolic zeal, so you can do all you possibly can to form yourself to become zealous apostles for Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Closing comment. A little boy entered into the room of a priest, and on the wall... There was something written in Latin. The little boy said, What is that? What is that? That's my motto. Well, what is it? And he said, This is my motto. Give me souls and take all the rest. The name of that little boy was St. Dominic Savio. The name of the priest was the great John Bosco. Oh. Oh. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou. And bless the fruit of our Jesus. <coughs> Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless and have a great week.